right, bring that thing up here. Where, where is it? Oh. Hey, how many like superheroes? Kids, how many like superheroes? All right. Which is your favorite one? Oh, there's the Jesus answer. <laughs> okay, give him a smiley face over now. Now, be honest. I mean, that might be honest. Who? Spider-Man. Thor. Thor. All right, like, go ahead and show a video. I mean, I look back, there's like, you can pick from like about 200 superheroes, right? I just thought there were like 20, maybe. No, back in 1939, they were just coming out with superheroes left and right. And I don't know, Jimmy, if you got that slide, but, uh, you know, you got all kinds of options. The Hulk, Thor, Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, who's that? Iron Man, I don't know who the other guy is, but, uh, you know, we got Nat Man, we got, you know, Bug Man and Wasp Lady and, you know, all kinds of superheroes that you can choose from. My favorite, of course, is uh, Aquaman. As a kid, I always wanted to talk to the ocean critters and, and that kind of thing. And then there's the ladies. Don't, don't forget the ladies, right? We got Wonder Woman. We got uh, who? We got, I don't know who those other guys are, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you got all those other. There's Wasp Lady. Yeah, I know her. And the Black Widow. Yeah. So why do we like superheroes, kids? Because they can do cool stuff, right? Like better than the rest of the people. They're like superpowers, right? So if you had a superpower, what would your superpower be? All right, I didn't get it, but yeah. So let me just show you. Today, I just want to let you know, son and daughter of God, that you are superhuman, that you have a superpower called the Holy Spirit of God, the living God that lives within us, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that enabled Jesus to walk on water, to command the, right, the, the, the earth, the, the elements, the weather, it allowed him to raise people from the dead or heal the sick. That same power is living within you. This is our superpower, that you and I are supernatural, that you and I are superhuman. You're a superman and you're a superwoman. But sometimes, the big question is, are we superheroes? Ah, now there's a different question. Just because you have power within you, it's like, do we use it? Do we acknowledge it? Do we let it change us? And so that's what we're going to talk about today is, what is a disciple? We're going to continue on our series of discipleship. And, and the first thing I want to talk to you about is, as a disciple is, Spirit-led, it's, it's, it's spiritually alive. It's like, boom, something happened to us, right? A, a, a disciple is relying on and filled with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Not their own intellect, not their own strength, not their own prowess, personality, or influence. And that's the difference, right? Between a disciple and the rest of you and all, of us all who... Believe in Jesus, come to church, filled with the Spirit, but don't acknowledge it. We're not superheroes. We're just living like the rest of men on earth. Even though we have a power source that should elevate us above what goes on on the planet, how other people live, think, act. That would be the superhero in you and me. Disciples filled with the Spirit are not faking it, and they're not religious. They've died to their flesh, sin, as their master. They've died to the world as their home and as their desire. And they've been born again by the Spirit of God. We are new creations. The old is gone, the new has come. And like newborn babes, we learn now to live differently. The Bible says, Romans 8, we learned now to live by the Spirit. We once lived by the flesh and its desires. They were the things that drove us, the things that informed us. The world's values were our values. Now that we've been born of the Spirit and we have the mind of Christ and the mind of the Spirit, go through this week in your small group, read Romans 8 all the way through and then have a good discussion about that. Now we've got to learn to live by the Spirit. 
think by the Spirit, reason by the Spirit, and act as the Spirit would have us. Because he's calling us, it's our supernatural power. It's like, you know, I mean, Spider-Man had to learn to shoot webs, right? I mean, remember watching The Flash, he had to learn to run, right? It's like, oh, we got to learn to do these things. Like spiritual babes that hunger for truth and righteousness, like our kids here, we celebrate it. Our job as your church and as your leaders is to help you learn to walk in the Spirit. For unless we do that, we can have the supernatural power within us, but we're going to act just like everybody else. And then they won't look, they, they'll look at us and they won't see a difference in us, right? They go, you call yourself, what, sons and daughters of God? And Jesus even says this, he goes, why do you guys stress and worry like the rest of people who don't know God? Don't you, we, see a disciple lives like God is real, a disciple lives like the Bible is true, a disciple lives like he's empowered with a supernatural indwelling Holy Spirit that changes the world and that's who is our power source. A disciple believes that, lives like that. And Jesus goes, why do you guys worry about everything that the world worries about? Don't you know you got a father that loves you, that knows what you need before you even ask him? Just ask him. And he'll give you every good and perfect gift comes from your father. So why worry? Seek first the kingdom of God. And so there's got to be a difference in us if we're to be superheroes on the planet. If we're to be change agents, if we're to be peace bringers in, in a world of turmoil and conflict, right? We're the peacemakers. This is, our, this is our calling. The calling and commission that God has given you and I will never change. We'll get to that here in just a second, but let me just go on. So was a, a disciple is spiritually alive. Kids, in your notes, you've got four different things that a disciple is. I'm going to give them to you real quick. Is a son, is a servant is a student, is a steward, and is a soldier. And I changed this message last night, so we're not even going to get to that stuff. <laughs> it's on your notes, so I want to, I want to get that. We, the Holy Spirit can do more in you and through you than you could ever imagine. The Holy Spirit inside of a believer, a son or daughter of God, if we give him full reign, if we follow his lead, if we learn to listen and heed, can do things in us that we would never think possible. Not only in you and transform you into Christ's likeness, but help you overcome things that you could never overcome otherwise. Like, have you struggled to overcome sin with your own flesh? I have. Failed miserably. For a year... Every night, same story, spineless, weak-willed worm. You got to stop partying or stop praying. How long are you going to live in the fence? Well, I'm trying. I'm trying to live like a Christian. I'm trying to do God's work, God's will, God's way. But I wouldn't let God do it in me. I failed miserably. My spirit was willing. My flesh was weak. I could not overcome my flesh. I could not overcome my sin until I surrendered and let the Holy Spirit work in me. And I just said, you do it. I can't. And then all of a sudden, it's like, what? And then I look in the mirror and I go, who's that guy? I don't remember that guy. And everybody looks at me and goes, what happened to Dan Dix? Like, right? It's just like, I'm just following Jesus. The Holy Spirit's doing things in me. I'm just saying yes. I'm just his yes man. And he's changing me and doing things that I could never do before making me who I could never become, but who God created you to be. Because the enemy's got you under his thumb, and he's trying to manipulate, and he's trying to use all of the forces at his dispense to keep you from freedom, from joy, from peace, from the power that God wants to produce in and through you. And you've got to trust the Holy Spirit in your life. It's what God gave you. It's a supernatural power. Yeah, sometimes it's scary. Go with it, right? Everything you're struggling with today is an opportunity to learn from the Spirit how to live. Everything you're struggling with right now this morning is just an opportunity for the Spirit to teach you how to live. You got fear going on in your life? 
What is the Holy Spirit going to tell you? How is he going to tell you to live right now? You got concerns about your kids. You got concerns about your health. You got concerns about the finances or the economic of the future. God's got the future. What would the Spirit say to you? You see, this is how a Christian, a disciple, ought to live. Listening to the Spirit's voice over the many voices around us in the world, including the internal voices, and go, that's the voice of God. That's how I should live. That's, and then, and then Holy Spirit, help me not fake it, but live it fully, right? It's like, God, help me get there. And he does. It's like, we're babes. It's like, ah. Oh. You know, you tell your kids what to do and what to think and what not to do and how to react. And they go, oh, but the rest of the kids on the playground, they do it this way. And they go, yeah, but you, I want you to live differently. Okay, help me, Mom and Dad. I'm going to try. And we do. The Holy Spirit helps us. He's our helper. Every problem we face, there's a lesson to be learned that we might rise up and become the supernatural overcomers that God's called us to be. Ephesians 3.20 is one of my favorite verses. It says, uh, no, that's not, oh, there it is. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we can ever ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You ought to memorize that one. He's able to do immeasurably more than you can ever amask, ever ask or imagine. According to his power that's at work within you. You couldn't do it. But he can, he's committed to it, and he's capable of it. It's not a big deal for him. The big deal is to get your attention, your mind, and your trust to say, here I am, do it. Do in me what, you, what I could never do. Do in me what you planned to do when you created me. I trust you. You're my superpower. Help me learn to live with that. A disciple recognizes that in Christ we live and move and have our being, and apart from him we can do nothing. So Jesus says, remain in me and you'll bear much fruit apart from me. You're just human, but I've called you to be more than just human. I've called you to be connected with me, spiritually alive, spiritually on fire, spiritually powerful. But apart from me, you can't do that. Number two, a disciple is sensitive to the Spirit's voice, his move, and his direction. That's why prayer, talking and listening to God, is so important. If your prayer life isn't just your source, I mean, it's, it's got to be your oxygen, right? How are you going to know what the Spirit's doing in you if you're not talking to Him, listening to Him, heeding His advice? If the Word of God's not alive in you, because the Spirit and the Word work together, then you're just easy prey. See, the disciple, the supernatural, the one that's filled with the Spirit, the Spirit of God in you will be speaking to you, moving in you, trying to guide you, comfort you, do, take every problem that you face and speak a word of truth or life or instruction to you. And many times he's going to lead you to the word of God and say, this is what God said. This is the eternal word. It's alive and active. Let me remind you of what the word of God says, right? So we've got to get our head in the word, and then we've got to pray and listen. That's why discipleship is so important. We'll never grow up into who we're created to be. As I mentioned, Jesus says in Luke 19, he mentions it in Matthew 6, you know this, and uh, Jesus says, don't be concerned about what to eat or what to drink or worry about all these kind of things that the world worries. These are the things that dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. This is what the world worries about. These are people that don't know God, but your Father knows what you need. So seek His kingdom and His righteousness and all these other things that you need He'll take care of. 1 Corinthians 1, 9 through 12. Uh, do we have that one, 1 Corinthians? It says, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no mind has conceived. You get that one up for me, Jimmy? 1 Corinthians 1, 9 through 12. Well, if you don't know it, here's, let me just say it. 
What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no mind has conceived, the things, these are the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And he's revealed it to you by his spirit. Who knows what a man thinks within him except the spirit of, that lives within you. And same is true about God. Who knows the mind of God except the spirit of God. And God has given you his spirit so that you and I might know the mind of God. Isn't that crazy? And that we might understand the things that he has freely given us as sons and daughters. That this superpower, the Holy Spirit within us becomes our connector and becomes our revealer and gives us understanding and supernatural wisdom so that you and I can rise up out of the world, out of mere humanness, to being connected with God and understanding what's going on in the world. That's what he wants, that you and I would be able to do that. And so he's given us his spirit, the mind of Christ, that we might understand the things of God, what no eye has seen or ear has heard or mind has even conceived. This is what God wants you to know. And it's just like, yo, thank you. But how many of us actually do that, use that, listen to that, have trained ourselves or been discipled such that we are in sync with God's heart and his voice, and his spirit. When the world says go left, and the right says go right, and, and you know, somebody says no fight back, and right, you got all these voices, and it's like, what does the spirit say? Because sometimes we as Christians, it's hard to distinguish whether we are any different than the world. Because we act and react the same way. It's like, oh, Jesus, help us. So I want to get real relevant that this is what a disciple looks like in these times and days. Because this is nothing new. We have a pandemic. We have a political polarized situation right now. Right? We've got fear. We don't know the future. And no matter who wins this thing, things are going to get crazy for the other side. Right? It's just like, so what's the end game? Even if we whoever the we is, you, your team wins. So what? Does anybody get saved? Did anybody get better? Did anybody get healed? Did anybody get set free? Did anybody become more like Christ? Did anybody, right? So what, who wins? And I say that knowing the the issues. Yeah, we're going to read here in just a minute a, a great passage and unwrap it. Let me shoot to it real quick, but one more relevant piece that I think a disciple does and that's relevant for today is a disciple really loves the church. He doesn't bail on her. She doesn't bag on her. She doesn't destroy or divide her. A disciple loves the body, the family, the kingdom. I know right now that's just like a lot of churches not meeting and then here, here's the deal. Religion is the greatest enemy of the kingdom. Religion. It's fake. It's man-made. It goes through the motions. It has no power. And a wounded Christian is the greatest weapon of the enemy. Religion's the greatest enemy. Wounded Christians are the greatest weapon. Because what happens to a wounded Christian the enemy tells them how to react. We start barking, bagging on the church, we leave the church, we bail on her, or we just start ripping her up, right? We divide it. It's just like, yeah, there's messed up stuff. I'm not... But what does a disciple do when it, get, it hits the fan? What does a disciple do when bad things happen? Do I bail on it, on God's kingdom? Do I bail on fellowship do I you know do I just and we do but what did Jesus do when the religion right they didn't do it for him he just kept serving God loving people what did the disciples do the church wasn't perfect then read Corinthians holy moly right it's like our job as sons and daughters disciples of Christ filled with his spirit is to make this thing beautiful make the kingdom of God the bride of Christ beautiful we're to confront our blemishes, ask God to forgive us, and get better, and move forward. And so I just want to, I'm not going to speak anymore on that, it's just like, it's relevant for today, 
If we're to be sons and daughters of God filled with his spirit, what would he say to us? How would we respond or react to? Now, whether we get together or not doesn't mean the church, it's, that's not the issue. It's not what the governor says. It's not what, it's what do I say in my heart about the church, the people of God, the gathering of Christ? Because I can gather with two or three of you, and I ought to. But see, the enemy wants us to do something else. And so it's really hearing the, hearing and getting the mind and the heart of God, right? You and I, his sons and daughters, his representatives on the planet. Number four, I'll just finish on this one because we're going to spend a little time here. A disciple is a soldier. You are a soldier, whether you realize it or not. In a spiritual sense, there's a war going on. It's a serious war. It's a battle for every man's soul, and you're called to engage in that battle. You're called to fight for one of the two teams. You've stepped out of darkness, supposedly, when you said yes to Jesus, to fight or to represent and to push back darkness. It says the gates of hell will not prevail. But I think the enemy's stolen our sword. We're sitting in the bunker playing cards. We're not fighting. We're not serious. We're not disciples. But a disciple is a soldier. It's what the Bible says. And we are at war. Although we don't war like the rest of the world, and we don't fight the battles the rest of the world is fighting. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4 says this. It says, I beg you that when I, I'm sorry, yeah, when I come to you, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. See, this isn't anything new. This, what I'm talking about today in our world, Christianity in the world. Kingdom of God invading the kingdom of darkness, pulling us out. So it's always called catch and release. God gets a hold of us and then he sends us back in. But to be different, right? Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, don't think that we live by the standards of this world. That's not us. For though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with and the battles we wage are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, the weapons we have, superpower, have divine power to demolish strongholds. We take thoughts and imaginations captive and make an obedient to the truth of Jesus Christ. And, and so we are at war, and you are a warrior. Whether your short sword is sharp or not, it's time to sharpen it. It's time to get out of the bunker and get on the battlefield and play your part, and be victorious. Because one of the things that God's given us power by his Holy Spirit to do, like I said in the beginning, is overcome all the powers of darkness. You have that power in you to overcome sin, to overcome the devil, and to know and to demolish every stronghold that he set up against you and I. Yeah, somebody ought to thank you. Yeah, let's join with her. See, this is... What God has called you and I to, not to be victims, not to be little sheep going, eh, I hope that the government doesn't do something to us. This is like, what can the government do to you? What can man do to you? God says, if God is for you, who can be against you? Now, rise up and be who you're called to be. Know the battles, fight the right battles, and fight them with the weapons God's given you. Not these, not rhetoric. You see, everything wants to suck us down into the world's narratives. They tried to do that with Jesus. What do you think about Caesar? What do you think about paying taxes? I'll pay Caesar what it's his and pay, give God what's his. Well, what about Moses? Jewish politics. Should we obey Moses or should we obey you? Moses said we should stone the woman. What do you say? Moses, they, they washed their hands. What about your disciples? You see, it was always pulling us to these sidebar issues, trying to get us to fight one another. And what do you say, son and daughter of God? Is it the left or it's the right? In other words, do black lives matter because the left has made it a political agenda, or do black lives matter because everybody's created in God's image with equal value? Conversely, do the unborn lives matter because the political right makes it their agenda, or because everybody is born in God's image? You see what I'm saying? 
What is our battle and who are we battling and why are we fighting it? You see, this is the way we should always be. Not because the right or the left tell us we should do it, but because God says this is who we are in the world. The apostles had bigger problems after Acts. Now it became race issues. What about Jew and Gentile? We're all one in Christ. What about male and female? We're all one in Christ. What about rich and poor, slave and free? You see, political issues have always been around, and everybody wants to pull us down and, t- and change the narrative for us. Our narrative is Jesus Christ is the Lord of heaven and earth, and in his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven through you and I, his sons and daughters, his kingdom ambassadors, as we hand out the gospel, the good news of God's love and forgiveness, not counting men's sins against them. You see, Jesus never got pulled down. They tried to trick him, right? If we can get him to say this, join our team, then the other, right? And he made them both mad, and they ended up both killing him because they couldn't get him to join their agenda. Son and daughter of God, I want you to rise above it. I want us to rise above it. Our kingdom pushes back darkness, invades darkness. And um, let me just uh, read something here. We overcome evil not through politics. We overcome evil by good, Romans 12 says. We bless those who persecute us. We do good to those who curse you. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the right or against the left. It's against the spiritual darknesses, forces of darkness. Our job is to love people, share Christ with people, but to show them that they too can come out. It's, 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 it's really delicate, intentional, detailed, how to respond in every situation that we need to be trained in by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, so that we can have an apt answer like Jesus did to every situation. It's not a blanket statement. We're going to leave here and it's like you, you and I need to rely on the Holy Spirit to give us what to say in the moment to the crowd that's asking us what, this, you know, what life is about. As I said, our calling and commission that God has given us has not nor will change. We're called and commissioned to represent his kingdom. 2 Timothy 3, 4 says, a disciple doesn't get involved in in civilian affairs. A good soldier of Christ tries to please his commanding officer. So what does it mean to get involved in worldly or civilian affairs? Um, do you have that verse for me? Because I want you all to see it. 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. Paul says to Timothy, join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. This is my people. I had a, a friend who's not walking with the Lord who says, well, depending on how this election comes down, I may leave the country. Because my people, and I said, your people, who are your people? I'm being represented. I said, who are your people? And this used to be a son of God, right? It's like, who are your people? Is it the people that think like you, or is it the kingdom of God? Is it Jesus? You see, I love, and I don't know if I can say this, we have a politician in the room. I love it because he represents the kingdom of God in, his, in, in the environment. He has to make decisions on all kinds of issues, but he knows that his place is to represent God. And God has chosen him for that place. And God has chosen you in the places where you feel called and led. He's chosen you in those environments to represent him, to be different than everybody else in the world, <laughs> right? Supernatural, filled with a supernatural power. So Paul says, join me in suffering like a good soldier. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. 
pastor in Washington, D.C. wrote this back in 2012, and it's true today as well. I don't for a minute believe Paul here advocates withdrawal from society or civic rights, not for a minute. I do maintain that this, admin, this admonition and so many others provides us a clear warning against entanglements in the world, with the world, with worldly affairs, outside a soldier's concern. Entanglements that distract us from the real battle and our commander-in-chief's orders. We can get distracted. That's why a soldier doesn't have a job, doesn't get involved in worldly affairs so that he can be singularly focused on the, on the task at hand. And, and when we get, as sons and daughters of soldiers, entangled, we get distracted. We start fighting lesser battles. The enemy can use us and he just starts fires left and right and then he turns us against one another. Now we're fighting each other. Now we don't know what we're fighting for or whose team we're on. It's like, what? How'd that happen? Because we got more concerned about some things than the main thing. He writes this, and I'm going to read it because I think it, it's a challenging word. When a pastor or a church leader tweets all the retweets of the world, not with a biblical perspective, just one-liners, memes, and character assassinations of the world's pundits and the world's wisdom, we are involved in civilian affairs. We act the way civilians are acting and are entangled in the world. When the pastor or leader writes in such a way that they are easily mistaken as a party loyalist rather than a discerning voter and a son or a daughter, a representative of the kingdom, then they're involved in worldly affairs to a point where they're unrecognizable. When the Christian leader comments, comment, when the Christian leader's comments reflect the world's perspective, the world's venom, the world's rhetoric, the world's narratives, then we're taken by the enemy and blindsided in a deceptive and deadly way. The Christian commentary has left the world with the impression once again that to be a Christian is to be on one side or the other of the coin. It's fostered the impression that the other side is antichrist. And it's gone further. It sometimes suggests that there's nothing supernatural about being a Christian at all. All our concerns are just the world's concerns, thinly veneered with religious language, but seeping with the same hatred, anger, anger and violence. We just want to politicize Jesus and cover it up with rhetoric. We need to, be, we need to have better candidates to represent our concerns for sure, but some of us need to be better representatives before we start evaluating any candidate. You see, that's what I think is... That's, that was written eight years ago in an election year. That hadn't changed. The world wants to make you part of its system and use you to do its thing. And, and God says, no. I pulled you out of the world to do my thing, which is to bring truth, light, righteousness, love, joy, peace, forgiveness, hope, eternal life to the planet. Because at the end, November 4th, it don't matter who wins. Will anybody know Jesus as a result of you and your life and your representation of him? So I believe these are some of the things a disciple does, a disciple is in these times. And I'm just going to close in this, is just because we may not ever run, get to it. Matthew 16, soldiers do not fear death. Soldiers do not fear death. Death is merely a human concern. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Jesus. Matthew 16, 21 through 27. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day in order that he might be raised to life. Well, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him and said, Lord, not under my watch. That's never going to happen to you. 
I'm going to grab a sword. I'm going to cut somebody's ear off. We're going to fight for you with weapons of the world in order to accomplish the things that I think are important. Jesus turned and said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I'm not worried about death. I'm worried about life and forgiveness, and I'm going to do it. And the apostles didn't worry about death. Revelation, they overcame the devil by the power of the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb, and the word of their testimony, and they didn't shrink back even from their own death, it says. They weren't worried about dying. What are you worried about dying for, Christian? You got heaven. You just got an opportunity to represent heaven on earth for a few years with the power of God living in you and through you so that you can rise up and be different than the rest of the world. Do you look, smell, act differently than anybody else around you? And what is that difference? That's what we asked last week. It's the Spirit of God saying to us, how is he moving in us in this pandemic time? What are we scared of? So here at Outlook, we're going to take communion, and it's really just a time for us to sort of sit and meditate on the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Christ. There's cups in front of you in the chairs. Some of them are on the seats. Some of them are under the seats. I don't like them any more than you do the way we have to do it these days, but it's not what it is. It's not... It's why we do what we do. And what are we doing? What we're doing is we're saying yes to Jesus, who said to you and me, when we gather, would you remember me? And I'm saying yes. Every time he asks me, would you remember me? The sacrifice I made so that you might be free, you might be sons and daughters. We're born again by the Spirit. Because he took our sacrifice, he took our punishment so that we might be free. Now live as free men and women, supernatural, super empowered. Rise above it and show the world So, Father, as we take the communion this morning or at home or in whatever setting, we just want to stop and pause and acknowledge you, your lordship, your sovereignty, your kingdom. And that you've made us a part of it by your blood and by the spirit that drew us to you, that opened our eyes and informed us of your lordship, that changed us. That spirit, Lord, that lives within us, that when we were born again of the spirit, became your sons and daughters and your representatives, Lord. We want to live like you're real and like the Bible's true and like we are indeed who you said we are, your sons and daughters. That your spirit in us, Lord, will give us power that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived, unimaginable power that no, that we wouldn't even think or imagine that you could do in us and through us, Father, according to your power, your spirit that's at work within us. Change us. Without you, we can't do anything, but with you, we can do all things. Lord, make us like you. Help us think like you, react like you. Help us know how to walk on this earth, being in it but not of it, being representatives of your kingdom. We change jerseys. We are at war, and we're your soldiers. We're about your business as our commander-in-chief to take this gospel to the whole world with words, without words, in action and truth, to love well, to forgive well, to bring peace. But Lord, not to, and to to know what, what our battle is and know how to battle it. Lord, yes, we're going to vote for the right of the unborn. Yes, Father, we're going to vote for every life that matters. 
Yes, Father, give us wisdom to know how to be civically responsible in this time. Give us, but help our faith and our hope to be in you, Lord, that no matter what happens, we believe in your word that says you're sovereign over the affairs of man. So use us, Father, yes. Use our voice, use our influence on this earth as your sons and daughters, but we trust you with the outcome. And Father, more than our wants, more than what we think should happen, we know you know better. We don't have in mind just things of humans of this earth, but what you have in mind. You went to the cross because you had something greater in mind than death. Lord, we don't know what's going on or what's going to happen in the future, but we know you. And that you have it all under your control. And the many days or the few that I have left on this planet, Lord, you've called me as your son, your soldier, your saint, your servant to make a difference in the darkness that exists and to bring light. And so, Father, help us fight that battle with the weapons of warfare that you've given us in the Spirit to demolish strongholds. Show us how that looks, Lord, on a day-to-day -day basis. But I pray that your peace, that your joy, the hope of heaven would be our fuel. Your spirit would be our oxygen, your mission, our calling, our purpose, Lord, as soldiers would be our goal in life to please you and to fulfill that for which you called us. You saved us, and then you left us on the planet to do and fulfill something, Lord. Empower us to do it supernaturally, Lord. Empower us to become all you created us to be and to represent you. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your sacrifice, Jesus. Thank you for the cross that made us yours and set us free. Help us now live free. In Jesus' name we pray and for the sake of the world. Amen.